Okay, so a very good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for joining me for this month's <coughs> film reading session. Before we begin, um, if anyone is having any problems either hearing me or seeing my screen, then let me know now and we can do our best to sort it out. Uh, the other thing is if you guys can mute your microphones if you're not talking, that would be great as it'll hopefully improve the sound quality for everyone. Um, this is very much an interactive meeting, so uh, if you have any questions at all during the session, then uh, please, please feel free to shout out um, or uh, type it into the chat um, if you're feeling a little shy. Okay. So for those of you who are new to these film reading sessions, uh, this is me. So my name is Ian Jones, and I graduated from the RVC in 2003. I got my imaging certificate from the RCVS in 2009, and I finally got my European diploma in veterinary diagnostic imaging in 2018. And you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists, which is a multidisciplinary referral hospital in North London. And if I can be of any assistance to you whatsoever, if you have any questions at all about any radiographs you might have taken, or if you'd like to have a chat about a case because you're not quite sure which imaging modality would be most useful, then feel free to get in touch either by giving the clinic a call on this number or dropping me an email at this email address. So like I said, this session is very much a discussion about this month's cases. So I'm not going to present these cases to you. Um, I'd very much like to hear your opinions on the cases and we can have a chat about some of the uh, pertinent radiographic features together and what they might mean. You guys will hopefully have had a chance to have a look at the cases and uh, what uh, tends to help in terms of preparing for these sessions is just to prepare um, just a short radiology report. And I wouldn't spend too much time on this, so roughly 15 minutes per case. I would come up with a radiographic description using all of those um, radiographic buzz terms that we always like to hear. And based on the description, come up with some conclusions, which should include a list of differential diagnoses. And if it's appropriate, to grade those diagnoses with the most likely differential first and the least likely last. And then if you have any recommendations, if you feel that the patient might benefit from any additional imaging, um, then include that at the end. So before I open up the floor and uh, we start discussing this month's cases, we'll just look at an example, which is a case that uh, we reviewed uh, a couple of months ago. So this was an eight-year-old female neutered beagle that presented vomiting. And what we have is just a single right lateral radiograph. And the thing that strikes me initially about this radiograph is just how much the small bowel is bunched in the middle of the abdomen. And not only is the small bowel bunched in the middle of the abdomen, um, there's also uh, a loss of serosal detail that seems to be quite focal. So in the center of the abdomen, um, we're struggling to see some of the margins of the small bowel, and maybe the margins of the greater curvature of the stomach. Whereas in the remainder of the abdomen, the serosal detail looks pretty normal. Uh, the other thing that's striking about the small intestines here is the gas pattern. So uh, rather than um, have empty bowel or have bowel that uniformly contains gas, we've got little focal areas of gas accumulation and they have quite an unusual shape. So a lot of them almost look like little commas. Uh, the stomach is also reasonably full. So there's radiopaque material in the stomach. I wouldn't necessarily describe it as being markedly dilated, but it's quite full given that the rest of the abdomen and the gastrointestinal tract looks reasonably empty, and um, particularly the colon. Um, so really not very much fecal material in this patient's colon at all. Now, uh, the fact that we have this uh, very characteristic gas pattern, I've got these uh, comma-shaped focal areas of gas, 
Uh, that for me is very characteristic of the sort of gas pattern that you get with plication in the small bowel. And if you see plication in the small bowel, then you have to be very suspicious of something like a linear foreign body. So that would be top of my differential list here. I might be suspicious that this dog had a, a linear foreign body. The fact that the stomach is full as well makes me super suspicious. So a predilection site for linear foreign bodies in dogs is the pyloric outflow. So in dogs, a lot of linear foreign bodies, particularly, fab particularly fabric foreign bodies, um, will anchor themselves at the pyloric outflow and then drift down into the duodenal lumen and the duodenum and the jejunum just past the caudal flexure will start bunching up and placating around that linear foreign body. So my recommendation uh, here, uh, if I was feeling super brave, and I think uh, it is possible to, it's possible and reasonable to recommend an XLAP um, in this patient just based on this radiograph. Uh, but if you wanted some additional clarification, you could potentially uh, suggest an abdominal ultrasound, and that would nail it on for you because you'd see beautiful application of the small bowel because that is indeed what this dog had. So this little beagle, I think, it had eaten a whole bunch of fabric foreign bodies, including a pair of tights, which had anchored at the pylorus and was extending into the duodenal lumen. And there was a huge amount of application of the duodenum around that linear form body. So that's that's the sort of description that we're looking for in these sessions. Um, if you guys would like to comment on the quality of the radiograph, I think that's fine. Um, so uh, if you'd like to comment on, say, the positioning and suggest whether it's optimal or suboptimal and how it could be improved um, on the exposure, uh, on the centering and the labeling, I think that's all fine. Uh, but what we're really can, what we're really interested in are those pertinent radiographic features that are going to allow us to come up with a differential list that'll hopefully contain the patient's diagnosis. So that was a little example just to kick things off. So before any, without any further ado, let's get on to case number one. Uh, which is a six-year-old male neutered domestic short hair that has presented to you with acute onset dyspnea. So uh, you have a couple of radiographs to review here. Um, who would like to take case number one? I'm happy to give it a go, Ian. Yeah, excellent. Go for it. <clears throat> okay, so um, we have a right lateral thoracic radiograph and a DV view of the thorax. Um, in a skeletally mature cat. Um, starting with the lateral, um, the cardiac silhouette is elevated from the sternum. Um, ventral to the apex is radiolucent. I can't see any pulmonary architecture in there. Um, so I believe it's consistent with pleural gas rather than parenchyma. Um, in the caudodorsal thorax, there's a margin um, where the caudal lobes are kind of markedly retracted from the thoracic wall. Um, and dorsal to them is radiolucent gas opacity. Um, those lobes are also kind of markedly reduced in size and increased in opacity, and there's no air bronchograms that I can see. Um, there's also a well-circumscribed round and gas lucent structure within one of the caudal lobes, um, which I, I guess could be a below or just a semi-rated lung. Um, superimposed over the cardiac silhouette, um, um, there's also more lung that's kind of reduced in volume and increased in opacity. Um, the diaphragm appears intact. Um, I can't see any rib fractures. And I also believe the caudal vena cava is reduced in diameter. Then moving on to the DV, um, at the caudal aspect of the right hemithorax, there's a, a kind of large triangular radiolucent area um, consistent with gas. Um, and I can't see any pulmonary architecture there either. Um, and then cranial to that in the kind of mid and cranial right hemithorax, there's increased opacity to the lung. Um, on the left side, there's marked retraction of the lung fields from the body wall with gas lucency in between. Um, the cardiac silhouette is not visible on the left side, which I think could suggest mediastinal shift. And then on that same side, um, on the left, um, the diaphragm is displaced cordially um, and I think it's possibly tented at one point, um, kind of onto the costal attachment of the rib. Um, <clears throat> then I think um, there's also kind of a possible inconsistency in the body wall on the left side, um, kind of at the most caudal extent of the thorax, kind of at the level of the 13th rib, which I think could represent a penetrating injury. Yeah, just there. Okay. Um, 
I can't see any rib fractures and I think the diaphragm is also intact. Um, so then in terms of interpretation, I think kind of because of the degree of collapse um, the caudal displacement of the diaphragm with tenting um, and the kind of contralateral mediastinal shift, uh, the diagnosis I, I think is most likely is a left-sided tension pneumothorax with evidence of secondary lung collapse. Um, and then treatment, I, I think, if if that is a penetrating injury, try and occlude that, um, thoracostentesis and then surgery. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, I have very, very little to add to that. So uh, hopefully um, you guys can see all of those uh, features uh, that were, were just described. So uh, we certainly have got a large volume pneumothorax here, as evidenced by the retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall. So these soft tissue opaque structures here um, are lung lobes. And um, we can see another lung lobe just here. So this is the uh, dorsal margin of what's probably the left caudal lung lobe. And here we have uh, the margins of the right caudal lung lobe. And we have uh, a structure uh, within that right caudal lung lobe that is clearly marginated and um, has a, a, a gas opacity. So that's that's a gas lucency. It has the same radio opacity pretty much as the gas that we think is accumulated in this pleural space. Um, we've got elevation of the cardiac silhouette, which again is a key feature of a pneumothorax. Um, and not only do we have retraction of these caudal lung lobes, but we also have really marked retraction of the cranial lung lobes from the thoracic wall and the sternum. Um, so uh, huge volume pneumothorax here. So alarm bells um, should be ringing. And uh, in the DV view, um, as we described, we've got this huge amount of gas lucency in the left pleural space. We've got retraction of the left caudal lung lobe from the thoracic wall. It's pretty tricky to see the left cranial lung lobe. And then we have the right caudal and potentially the right cranial, right middle um, and right cranial lung lobes um, superimposed over what is most likely the, the cardiac silhouette. Um, we can see the trachea here, which is pushed over to the right. So, I mean, this is this is a reasonably straight radiograph, but the trachea pushed way over to that right side. And then we've got the main stem bronchi. Now, um, I, I agree that, that maybe there is a little bit of effacement of the margins of the body wall here. However, we're not really seeing any evidence of a traumatic injury. So we're not seeing any emphysema has change to those soft tissues. Now, you don't always see that. Um, we're not seeing any soft tissue swelling either. Um, so based on the radiographs, we can't say for certain that this cat definitely hasn't suffered a penetrating injury to its thorax, um, but there's not really much there to, to suggest that. So we've got no rib fractures, there, there are no abnormalities to any of the extra thoracic structures like the, the ribs, the vertebra or the sternebra. Um, there's no soft tissue swelling or um, emphysema has changed to the soft tissues. Um, but there is another structure that you described the, that could potentially give us a clue as to what might be responsible for this cat's uh, large volume tension pneumothorax. Um, and I mean, you've, you've already uh, given us the answer really. So uh, this, this structure here, uh, you, which I'm not sure whether you concluded on, you certainly mentioned it in the, in the description. I absolutely agree that the, the radiographic appearance of the structure clearly marginated, it's round, it's, it's got a gas opacity, um, is, is most likely to be a pulmonary bulla. And given that we've got a bulla in what's most likely the right caudal lung lobe, um, it's uh, more than likely that this cat has a has other pulmonary bulla, and it could be that one of these bully has ruptured, uh, resulting in this cat's tension pneumothorax. And that's essentially what, what happened in this case. So um, this cat had a bulla that, that ruptured, and then uh, we had a huge amount of gas leak into the pleural space, and we've got this, this tension pneumothorax. So as you described, we've got this beautiful mediastinal shift um, to the right, and we've got a really flattened, and, and I agree that the diaphragm in the DV does look a little bit tented, really flat, tented diaphragm as a result of all of that gas and that pressure that's, um, that, that's accumulating in that pleural space. Um, so yeah, really good job. So this cat has a large volume tension pneumothorax, and it has a pulmonary bulla, and our suspicion is that this cat 
has another bulla that's ruptured. So one of the things to bear in mind is you're not going to see the bully that have ruptured. So if you're dealing with patients that have a, have a spontaneous pneumothorax secondary to a pulmonary bulla rupturing, then you're not going to see it on radiographs or CT because when the bulla ruptures, the lung lobe that uh, is affected it essentially collapses around it. So he, there's no more gas in that bulla because the gas has escaped into the pleural space. So you, you're not going to see the bulla that's ruptured that was responsible for the pneumothorax. But if it has other bully, then you might see it. And that's that's what's happened in this case. So so this cat has had a bulla that's ruptured. We've got a huge amount of gas that's uh, accumulated in the pleural space, causing this tension pneumothorax. And it happens to have another bulla as well, which gives us a little bit of a clue as to what might have caused um, this tension pneumothorax. So um, this uh, this cat certainly needs some thoracocentesis. Uh, one of the things that I remember one of my tutors describing is if you have such a large volume pneumothorax um, that you can see structures that look a little bit triangular like this. I mean, these are the collapsed lung lobes because of the large volume of gas within the pleural space. They look a little bit like the wings of the angel of death. So if you see the wings of the angel of death as a result of a pneumothorax, you really need to drain that patient's chest urgently. Um, and that's essentially what happened here. And I think this cat went on to have uh, an exploratory thoracotomy and, and a lung lobectomy. I think it did reasonably well. So yeah, good job. Um, that is case number one. Does anybody have any questions at all about case number one? Um, you can shout it out or uh, you can type it into the chat. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So in the lateral, in the right lateral, there is a sort of um, elongated shapes of tissue opacity is on dorsal to the second, third vertebra. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, you can I hear? No, it's in the uh, sorry, in the vertebra, in the sternebra. Oh, the sternebra. Oh. Yeah, there is so this sort one, of two, three, this around here. Yeah, is it just dorsal? It just addition to the to the sternebra. Yeah, can, yeah. can you see that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think it's just superimposition or can it be the, I mean, it's a bit codal, but can, can it be the um, sternal uh, lymph node? Yeah, yeah no, I, I could totally buy that. that. That could be a sternal lymph node, absolutely. Okay. If it's not a sternal lymph node, then I'm, I'm not sure what it is. Um, so, yeah, sternal lymph node, I, I can absolutely buy that. It's, it's in about the right position because we've got so much gas within the pleural space here. Um, it, it's going to be easier for us to see the boundaries between the soft tissue structures within the thorax. So um, mediastinal structures as well. So yeah, I can absolutely believe that that was a sternal lymph node. And can I ask another thing? Sorry, yeah. because because the cavitary bulla, I mean, is not so well defined. I mean, it's marginated, but usually when when you see when you see it, you can see really, you know, a really well defined rim. Yeah. Do you will put on the and because of do you know you can see the lymph nodes also. Do you will put on differential diagnosis also? neoplasia um i think i think so you you, you can much. yeah no I, I think you're right i mean i have seen adenocarcinomas that are surrounded by gas but usually they're they're soft tissue structures so you'll see a focal area of soft tissue that is um, more radiopaque than the surrounding pulmonary parenchyma. And uh, you're right, occasionally, you do sometimes see some gas accumulation around those lesions. And I think that's really difficult to appreciate on radiographs at times, but um, just in the last couple of months, we've had a few cats that have had um, pulmonary tumors, carcinomas, where there's a soft tissue mass that's surrounded by a little bit of gas. And those those structures, uh, it can be very difficult to confidently predict what they're going to be. Uh, but we've 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 FNA quite a few of them, and they've, they've always come back as carcinomas. But the the most pertinent and the the most important features of kind of a primary lung tumor would be um, they tend to be large, they tend to be solitary, they tend to be soft tissue opaque. A lot of carcinomas tend to be mineralized, and they tend to be peribronchial. So. Some of them can contain gas, but that wouldn't be typical. So I agree that, that the, the margins here, particularly ventrally, aren't, aren't as clear as uh, you might expect for a typical bulla. And I think part of the reason for that is because this lung lobe is, is collapsed. But um, it, it does have reasonably clear dorsal margins, and then it's undoubtedly uh, a, a gas-loosened structure. So 
I think Buller's got to be top of the list. Um, I, I couldn't say for certain that this this wasn't something neoplastic, but I think it would be further down the list. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions about case number one? If not, we shall move on to case number two. So case number two uh, is a 12-year-old female new to Tibetan Terrier and is presented to you with acute lameness of the left fore. Now, this is uh, a reasonably recent case. And uh, if anyone is familiar with it and knows the answer, then um, I suggest that you don't review it. Um, but if anybody else would like to have a pop at this one, then that would be great. Anybody like to take on case number two? I, I can do it if you yeah. want. Yeah, go for so it. So we have two projections. One is a left lateral and the other one is a um, craniocaudal yep. of the thoracic limb of a skeletally mature dog. Um, to be honest with you, I cannot see any um, um, like any abnormalities on, on the muscular part. Like uh, I cannot compare with the right limb, but I cannot see any swelling um, within the muscle. Um, if we check the craniocaudal view, there is um, just uh, a bit caudal to the uh, to the lesser tubercle of the of the humerus. There is a sort of ill-defined um, area, a sort of periosteal reaction. Okay. Um, is yeah is on more on the left side um which um if we zoom in it looks a bit palisading okay and um i think this is the main uh, finding in this uh, projection and in both of the projection to be honest Ooh, yeah and as differential diagnosis, because of the um, because of the the location, so proximal humerus, I would put um, as differential diagnosis tumor, yeah, um, osteosarcoma as a first one. Um, although it can be. Um, I mean, there are all other tumors that can affect the limbs, uh, like chondrosarcoma or hemangiosarcoma, osteocytic sarcoma. Yeah. But I will put osteosarcoma as first differential diagnosis. Okay. And if if it's that, I would recommend some chest um, view and plus or minus biopsy of of the of the zone of the humerus. Yeah. And then if the chest x-rays are fine, I uh, will probably, and, and, and this anosteos or coma will probably advise an amputation of the limb. Okay, yeah. No, no, I, I absolutely agree. So um, can everybody see the lesion here? So this is, is reasonably subtle, right, which is part of the reason why I included it. So um, I absolutely agree that I think there, there is a periosteal reaction um, just here on the proximal left humeral metaphysis. And you just wonder whether or not there might be some evidence of cortical destruction here, although it's very, very subtle and not particularly convincing. What I think is, is convincing is that there is a really poorly marginated focal area of reduced opacity at the level of the proximal metaphysis of this left humerus. So if we just concentrate on this area here, it looks less radiopaque than the adjacent medulla, both proximal and distal to it. And if we look back at the mediolateral view, then again, there's, there's an area here at the level of the proximal metaphysis of this left humerus, where there is a very subtle reduction in radiopacity. So if we look at the radiopacity of the mid and distal diaphysis, um, it looks normal. Um, so we've got normal trabecular bone detail and an appropriate radiopacity for a humerus. But as we extend towards the proximal metaphysis, we can see it, it 
we lose that that normal trabecular bone detail. It starts to look a little bit more moth-eaten, and the opacity is is certainly less relative to the the uh, diaphysis that is just distal to it. And that combined with the periosteal reaction that we can see um, on the medial aspect of that proximal humerus and, and the the suggestion that there could be some cortical destruction here should make us suspicious that this could be something sinister. Um, the location of all these changes as well is also very important. So uh, this is um, a proximal humeral metaphyseal lesion, which is a predilection site for bone tumors um, in dogs, so osteosarcomas. Um, so towards the knee and away from the elbow, this is away from the elbow, prox proximal humeral metaphysis. So um, if this is an osteosarcoma, this is, is going to be where it's most likely to, to hang out. Um, so when we are thinking about diagnosing aggressive bone lesions, there's a couple of features that we need to look for. So we need to principally look for any evidence of cortical destruction. Um, any evidence of lysis, and um, we can describe the lysis in various different ways. We can describe it as um, geographic, um, moth-eaten, or permeative, and um, this the, the difference between them is essentially how clearly marginated they are. So um, geographic lysis is very clearly marginated. Uh, moth-eaten just looks like um, little punctate radiolucencies, and then permeative looks like um, coalescing areas of radiolucency and is usually associated with more aggressive lesions. I mean, you could potentially say that this this looks like it. it it's a little bit more thick if I was going to hang a label on it. Um, you look for the periosteal reaction, and the more uh, irregular the periosteal reaction, the more likely it is to be aggressive. And you also look at the zone of transition. So a very long, indistinct zone of transition is something that you'd associate with an aggressive bone lesion. And here we've got the suggestion that, that we have got some lysis, maybe some cortical destruction. The zone of transition is very long and indistinct, and we've got uh, some evidence of a periosteal reaction. It doesn't look particularly irregular as periosteal reaction, but, but it does look like it's there. Um, and for a lesion to be aggressive, only one of those features needs to be present. So um, there's lots of reasons here to be um, very concerned that this, this lesion could be something sinister, like an osteosarcoma. Um, so, um, just uh, out of interest, um, how, how many we, you guys, how many of you guys were concerned about this lesion? How many of you felt that this was an aggressive lesion? How many of you you, you saw the lesion? Um, if uh, if you're a little bit reluctant to speak up, then uh, you can speak to me via the chat. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you say in the lateral on the um, crani cranial aspect, can you see like kind of all, like a dent just where the lesion is in the uh, cortical? You're looking here. Yeah, like yeah, a tiny bit of a dent. Yeah, potentially. So so there's there's just a suggestion that there could be some cortical destruction here, I think. Uh, and again, that is a feature that you'd, you'd associate with an aggressive lesion. So, yeah, I, I don't think that cortex looks entirely normal. Okay, so I think most of you had eagle eyes and you spotted uh, this lesion and hopefully uh, were concerned that it could represent something sinister like an osteosarcoma. So um, just out of interest, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a CT scan of this patient. Um, and the reason why I'm showing you the CT is just to demonstrate how useful a CT can be uh, in... Uh, removing any possible doubt that you might have about whether or not this lesion is is aggressive or not. So I'll just I'll just run through the CT very quickly, and then we can go back and, and have a little chat about it. Okay, so this is this is the affected limb here. We'll just run back, and hopefully you guys can see now. There is there's absolutely no doubt that there is a periosteal reaction here. Um, it's raised. And it's irregular and it's it's reasonably exuberant and um, there's definitely some cortical destruction here so uh, we can see uh, the cortex is destroyed on the lateral aspect of this proximal left humerus and there are multiple lucencies um, within the cortex in this metaphyseal region uh, we were correct in describing the zone of transition as being long and indistinct because it's very difficult to know where this lesion stops and where it starts. So all of those radiographic features 
you guys just described have essentially been confirmed by this CT scan. But hopefully you can appreciate just how much easier it is to see this lesion on the CT versus the radiographs. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't get an absolute definitive diagnosis from the pathologist for this patient, but uh, the pathologist was highly suspicious of osteosarcoma, and I think the radiographic features fit with that. So the things that I'd like you guys to take away from this case are the radiographic radiographic features of aggressive bone disease. So you need to look for evidence of cortical destruction. You need to look for any evidence of uh, lysis. Um, so moth-eaten and permeative lysis being the uh, two types of lysis that are most often associated with aggressive bone disease. Periosteal reaction, the more irregular, the more likely it is to be aggressive and the zone of transition. Um, and also the area that's affected. So if it's a predilection site for um, bone tumors and osteosarcomas, uh, really uh, the types of bone tumor we're most likely to see, then we need to be super suspicious um, about aggressive bone disease and osteosarcoma. All right. Great, so that was case number two. Good job. So moving on to case number three, which is a little different. So this is a nine month old female neutered French bulldog. Again, this is a fairly recent case. Um, so um, if you're familiar with it and you know the answer, then um, maybe give one of your colleagues uh, a chance to uh, have a look at the radiographs and describe the lesion. This little nine month old female neutered French bulldog presented to you uh, vomiting and regurgitating. So, who fancies case number three? I can try, Ian. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. So, we've got a left, right, and ventrodorsal views of the abdomen. Yep. So, I thought the overall serosal detail was pretty good for a young patient. Um, the stomach, fundus and body is moderately to severely dilated with gas. Um, there is some gas on the pylorus on the left lateral. Um, I wasn't completely, completely sure if on the VD uh, I could see, I think that's probably nothing, um, kind of on the region of the pylorus, um, just before the duodenum, there is kind of like a soft tissue around the, the structure um, that I couldn't see in a, any other view. Yeah. Um, there is a diffuse, mild to moderate, uh, small intestinal dilation, mainly with gas, um, and on the right lateral, I could see... Uh, one of the small bowel loops uh, kind of on the ventral abdomen, I thought it was quite dilated with fluid. Um, yeah, thing, yeah. yeah okay. that one. Um, what else? Uh, the, I couldn't see the column very well in any of the views. And then I, there was something that was catching my eye on the, I think it was on the left, I can't see, I can't see now on the right lateral, but I think I could see better on the left. Uh, um, I think, yeah, like ventral to L7, there is this kind of uh, soft, like kind of ill-defined rounded soft tissue opacity in the middle, kind of uh, with some gas speckles in the middle, which I wasn't completely sure whether if it's like fecal material or mm. like or something. Yeah. Um, the liver doesn't extend beyond the costal arch. I thought the spleen was fairly normal. On the VD, maybe a little bit displaced caudally because of the um, uh, dilation of the stomach. Uh, I could see the left kidney pretty well, and I couldn't see the right um, well on any of the views, and the blood, I couldn't see the bladder either. Yep. So I was uh, completely, completely sure. I think if this bowel loop is that, I mean, looks severely dilated, so I would be potentially a bit concerned of mechanical obstruction. Also, it's a jump puppy with like vomiting, so I think foreign body should be always kind of on the uh, on the list, um, yeah. the, that structure potentially could be like a foreign body or it could be feces. Um, and I'm not completely sure about that soft tissue opacity that I saw on the pylorus, um, which I couldn't see on the left lateral. 
So I think I, I, I don't know. I think I would I, I would uh, try to do an ultrasound to just further assess see whether if there is any suggestion of mechanical obstruction yeah. um, and take it from there. I think. Yeah, great. No, I absolutely agree with all of that. Okay, so just uh, out of interest, let's uh, just open up the floor a little bit. And again, um, if anybody has seen anything else um, or um, feels very strongly one way or the other that this dog should definitely be cut or definitely not be cut, uh, then yeah, either speak up and join the conversation or add a little comment in the chat. So I'd be interested to know how many of you guys would look at these radiographs and go, uh, I think this dog's probably just got gastroenteritis and it's probably fine. How many of you uh, might feel, you know what, I'm not really sure about this one. It's a little bit of, a little bit of a, there's a few things here that we should be concerned about and whether any of you would say, you know what, this dog needs to be cut, let's take it to theater right now. So we've got quite a few people saying that we should cut this dog got Maita and Tatiana and Rose are all saying that there's a foreign body here needs to be kept. Giorgio is saying that could be two, two populations of small bowel here, which again would be a reason to, to cut this dog. That is something that we'd expect to see uh, with the mechanical of ears. Okay, so let's go back and have a little look at these radiographs. So I, I agree that that in this VD view, we do have this soft tissue opacity here, just at the level of the pylorus, and we can see we've got gas within the stomach and then gas within the duodenal lumen. And potentially that, that is a little bit of a, of a worry. However, in the left lateral view, um, we've got gas filling up the pylorus and also filling up the duodenum, and we're not really seeing that soft tissue structure. So um, I think that probably is just the pylorus and, and it's, it's nothing that we need to worry about. But as you described, there are a few other things here that we should be concerned about. There, there are two different populations of, of small bowel. So we have got small bowel that is, is pretty empty. Um, and we've got another population of small bowel that um, is filled with gas. Now this, this structure here, um, I, I wasn't entirely sure whether this was a dilated loop of small bowel or whether it could potentially um, be the spleen um, because I'm struggling really to see the spleen in this lateral view. And if this is a big dilated loop of small bowel, then I'm really struggling to see it on the VD view. Um, but in that left lateral view, we can't say for sure that that isn't a dilated loop of small bowel. And if it is, then it certainly is dilated. Um, and that is a real worry. Um, so if this is all bowel, um, then there definitely are two different populations of small bowel. And one is dilated and one is completely empty. Um, when I read this initially, I felt that this, I wasn't convinced that this was small bowel. And even though I agree that there are two distinct populations of small bowel, I felt that the one was, was gas filled, but not particularly dilated. So it was difficult really to be 100% that this patient uh, was um, obstructed and, and had a mechanical ileus based on the um, the gas pattern and the radiographic appearance of the small bowel. And just like you, I, I kept honing in on this this structure here, I'm thinking oh, that structure looks pretty abnormal. What what is that structure? And we can see it in all three views. So we, we can see it here, um, and we can see I think it's this structure here, just in the the right sort of mid to caudal abdomen. Um, and then we can see it here as well. Um, and I like your description. I do think it's it's a soft tissue structure that has um, a mottled gas lucency. It's it's focal um, and it's in uh, the right um, cordoventral abdomen. And it, it could be feces. It's it's very close to where we'd expect the colon to be. And this this dog doesn't really have a huge amount of fecal material in the colon. It's it's pretty hard to see fecal material in the colon in, in any of these views. But that is how we'd expect fecal material to look. In the VD view, if, if this is indeed that structure and um, it is feces, then that is kind of a weird place for colon to be. So, you know, descending colon is going to be on the left here with transverse colon going um, from left to right and then an ascending colon on the right. It, it, it's, it's difficult really to believe that that, that is uh, just feces within the colon. But if it's not feces in the colon, then, then what is it? And then the answer is, well, it, it could absolutely be um, a foreign body. Um, and I have to say, when I looked at these radiographs, um, I, I wasn't, I was very concerned that this dog was obstructed, but um, I wasn't 100%. And this uh, patient did have an abdominal ultrasound, um, and it did have a foreign body. And I believe that this, this was the foreign body. Anybody have any ideas what this turned out to be? 
thing looks like a nut or something like yeah. a yeah, so I think that's that's a really good suggestion. So, so the fact that this is all kind of a, a mottled gas opacity, um, that I think um, gives it away. And I think this is a really nice example of um, of a fruit stone. So this this little French bulldog puppy um, ate a peach stone and, and was indeed obstructed um, and uh, had an X lap and had it removed. And, and I think this is the peach stone here. Um, I think from the surgeon's description, uh, this foreign body had gone way down the GI tract. So um, I think it was in um, the uh, ileum, not too far away from the ileocecal junction. So um, it, it had made its way almost uh, out of this dog, but but the dog was was vomiting and regurgitating and this did need to come out. So this is, this is a nice example of um, a radiographic example of a fruit stone, so a peach stone foreign body. Um, <clears throat> I don't have ultrasound images uh, from this case, so this wasn't a case that, that I scanned. Um, but these these foreign bodies on ultrasound, they have a very characteristic appearance. They're going to be very uh, shadowing. So you'll see a very hyper-echoic boundary and then lots and lots of associated acoustic shadowing. And if they're obstructed, <clears throat> then ORAD to the foreign body, the intestines will be really dilated, and ALBORAD, they'll be really empty. Um, and that's what nails it on an ultrasound. You have a shadowing structure, ORAD to it, so towards the mouth, oral towards the mouth, ORAD, you have big dilated bowel, shadowing foreign body, and then beyond that, alborad, the intestine is very empty. Um, so yeah, this is a nice example of a peach stone foreign body. So yeah, nice job. Um, I, I think you did a, a really nice job of describing those radiographs. Um, anybody have any questions about case number three before we move on to the final case of the evening? Can I ask a question? Yeah. In the left lateral and the VD projection, do you think the stomach is mildly caudally displaced, ventrocaudally displaced? Mm. I think I think in the left lateral, uh, the reason why it looks a little bit caudally and ventrally displaced is is because of the distribution of the gas. So I think in the left lateral, we've got uh, all of the gas going to the non-dependent part of the abdomen. So uh, towards the the, yeah yeah towards um, towards the right and so we've got the gas within the antrum and the pylorus so I, I think it, it looks a little bit displaced because of the gas distribution okay I think it looks the position looks pretty normal in the VD okay okay anybody else have any questions about case number three if you if you guys nailed that on as this is definitely mechanically obstructed and it's a foreign body and it's a peach stone, then you did exceptionally well because <laughs> that I think is quite a, is quite a quite a tricky one. All right, so let's go on to case number four, which is our last case of the evening, and it's a ten-year-old female neutered domestic short hair that's presented to you with diarrhea. So who fancies case number four? And this is this is kind of a fun case. I can try this one. Yeah. Um so in this case we have two radiographs, one left lateral and one VD, I imagine, for uh, the position yeah. of the legs, yeah. um, of a cutie cat, which is way overweight, as we said, mm -hmm. it's a big amount of fat. Um, the main features I can see in the lateral is loss, loss of detail of the abdominal structures in in both views but it's quite clear on this one yeah i think the structure we can see is slightly cranial in the image is probably the stomach which is gas filled yeah yeah and um you can see both of the kidneys uh dorsally i think one of them is slightly rounder than the other yeah and then in the mid abdomen we can see i would say more than two populations one one population but is clearly empty small okay. uh, small intestines with a little bit of air but quite empty yep. and then we have the bladder caudally and this structure in between 
the bladder and the intestines slash stomach liver, yeah. which when is... You, when you say this structure, you mean this the elephant in the room? This, this thing, yeah. Okay. This floating thing that is um, some, some way calcificated. Okay. And then if you go to the uh, ventrodorsal, it looks like the structure is somehow in part of the intestine. Okay. Doesn't look like it's on the inside, most like like around it. And I would say in this in this view, you can you can see two populations of intestines. In this view, I can see small intestines being quite thin and gas filled, and then some of them that looks slightly aboral that are more dilated. Okay. Um, because of the structure being calcificated, uh, my main difference was a mass yeah but I'm, I'm not sure if this is an intestinal mass that is potentially obstructing or half obstructing okay that's that's what i got okay yeah no nice job all right um <clears throat> anybody else have anything else to say about i mean really this is the main event here so what we are trying to work out is what is this thing and and where is it and what's it likely to be? Uh, I thought it was maybe either a Bates body. Okay. Or yeah. I didn't thought it was inside the gastrointestinal tract. Um, okay. And because I, I imagine if it was inside, he would have like signs of mechanical obstruction. Yeah. Um, but if it was like an entero leaves, maybe. But I think to me it's like a Bates body. I think. Okay. Yeah. No. I think um, I think that's a good suggestion. So um, just for for those delegates who, who might not know what a Bates body is, so a Bates body is um, a mineralized area of necrotic fat um, within the abdomen. So a Bates body is a differential for any sort of kind of peritoneal mineralization, and and you do see them they're not uncommon um, in cats. Um, and I agree uh, in terms of trying to, to localize the structure. So where, where is the structure likely to be? Um, I mean, there are two populations of bowel here. So th they all contain gas. There is some part of the bowel that contains a little bit more gas than other parts of the bowel. But those those bowel loops that contain more gas, I don't think they look particularly dilated. So I agree that I, I don't think there's any evidence, um, any convincing evidence of a mechanical ileus here. And, and this, this structure does look like it's just floating in the abdomen. It just looks like it's in the peritoneal cavity. So all of the intestines here, um, they're, they're reasonably um, dorsal actually, and they're in the mid abdomen. And in this lateral view, this structure doesn't really seem to be associated with any of those those um, loops of bowel. So it's, it's most likely that this is um, a structure that is just within the peritoneal cavity. And in, in that instance, we then need to start thinking about, well, the, the main radiographic feature of this thing is that it's mineralized. Um, so um, it's got a similar radiopacity to uh, bone. Um, it, it's, it isn't uniform in opacity, so it has um, a very um, a very opaque and, and in places quite clearly marginated periphery. Looks a little bit more mottled uh, in the center. Um, anybody else have any other comments about this abdomen and, and particularly the, the appearance of the peritoneal cavity surrounding the structure? Um, I'm just wondering if it could be a little bit of gas surrounding that um, nodular structure. And maybe there's a lack of contrast on the caudal abdomen, but mm. there's also some motor gas around it. So yeah. I would be suspecting possible fat necrosis around that. Yeah, um, yeah no, I think that's that's a good comment. So I, I absolutely agree that there's, there's lots of peritoneal cerebral detail here. And, and again, it's it's focal. And I think if, if you look at the, the dorsal and the caudal parts of the abdomen here, we, we, we can see beautiful margins. So we can see dorsal margin of the urinary bladder, see it beautifully. We can see the dorsal and ventral margins of the descending colon, they look great. We can see the kidneys nicely. And then in this sort of mid abdomen and particularly the mid ventral abdomen, it all just looks pretty fuzzy. It's, it's really hard to make out where the spleen is here. It's much harder to make out the margins of the stomach and the liver. There's definitely some focal loss of peritoneal cerebral detail here. Um, so I suppose with that in mind, well, if we have got loss of peritoneal cerebral detail, then um, would anybody like to take that and say, okay, 
that that might suggest that there is. What, what are you guys going to start worrying about if uh, we've got if, if we've got a loss of peritoneal cirrhosis detail? Yeah. Like peritonitis or yeah. cirrhosis. Yeah, abso- yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, we've got focal peritoneal lo- focal loss of peritoneal cirrhosis detail. It appears to be associated with whatever this structure is, and so there absolutely could be a focal peritonitis here and or a peritoneal effusion. Um, so uh, this. That's not necessarily something that you'd expect to see with um, just a Bates body. So if there was just incidental uh, mineralization of necrotic fat within the abdomen, you don't normally see an associated peritonitis and peritoneal effusion. It doesn't mean that it, it, it's, it's not a Bates body, but I suppose it goes further down the differential list. So the reason why this case is here um, is uh, because it gives us an opportunity to, to describe this thing. So you know, it's reasonably clearly marginated, it's got um, a mineralized opacity, it's slightly mottled in the center, so it's a bit more uniform in the periphery, loss of peritoneal cirrhosal detail in the mid-abdomen associated with this structure. Um, so the reason why it's here is for us to have a think about, well, we've got this this big mineralized structure. Um, it's it's kind of ovoid, it's it's reasonably clearly marginated. Like what what could that be? So it, this this gives us an opportunity to think about what sort of uh, differentials we would put down for this, given that it's a large mineralized structure within the um, right mid-ventral abdomen. And we've, uh, we've mentioned a couple of possibilities. Um, so um, we've, we've had a Bates body, um, so necrotic fat, um, uh, and, and a possible enterolith was mentioned. So cats can sometimes get these um, focal mineralized structures um, associated with their intestines and they look a little bit like this so they're, they're kind of ovoid um, we don't see them that often um, and, and usually they're they're incidental um, so this this could potentially be an enterolith um, again i think it's it's maybe further down the list because we've got associated peritonitis and peritoneal effusion but bates body enterolith um absolutely they, they'd be differentials here um so so yeah now we're we're opening up our if we see mineralize, if we see mineralization within the peritoneal cavity, then what should be on a differential list? So any of you guys have any other differentials? So Katie says granuloma. Yeah, absolutely. Could be, could be a granuloma. Anything else? Uh, Rosa says neoplasia. Yep, yeah, neoplasia always on the list. Any other suggestions? A mummified kitten, good one. Yeah, yeah. That's on the list. A mineralized lymph node. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, a big old mineralized lymph node, but yeah, I suppose. Teratoma as well from Tatiana. Uh, I mean, that's that's even rare. I'm not sure I've ever seen a, a teratoma, and I can't honestly say whether mineralization is a feature. But yeah, I like I like your thinking. Okay, so, so the other things um, I think that we need to think about, um, so just just going with the fact that we, we definitely have an associated peritonitis and we have a peritoneal effusion associated with this um, structure. Um, so I tapped the fluid in this cat and, and it was septic. So this cat had a septic peritonitis associated with, with whatever this structure is. Um, so. Other things I think we need to think about here uh, would be would be an abscess. Um, so abscesses um, can uh, be mineralized. Um, so uh, you, you can see mineralization of um, both the, the wall um, and the center of, of abscesses. So that's a possibility. Um, the other thing uh, that that you need to consider if you see lesions like this would be a gossip eye So um, usually they're kind of swabs that have been left over in the abdomen and that have abscessated. So I, I don't think it's not that this is necessarily a gossy pyboma. Um, I haven't seen too many of them, but usually um, they have this very characteristic sort of mottled gas pattern in the center, uh, and that's due to the gas that's within the swab that's been left behind. Um, I can't say that, that's, that this definitely isn't a gossy pyboma, but but it's, it's it needs to be on a differential list. Uh, other things, uh, mineralized lipoma, I suppose. Um, you can get, as well as enterolis, you can get these things called fecaliths. I don't think that's what this is, but I think it's, it would be on kind of an, an exhaustive differential list uh, for mineralization in the peritoneal cavity. 
Now, we can't say it's definitely not a foreign body, and then you start getting into weird and wonderful stuff like kind of mineralized parasitic cysts, and, and then we've already mentioned neoplasia. Now, I, I can't actually tell you what this is, unfortunately, um, because we didn't get a definitive diagnosis on it. Um, so um, this cat, unfortunately, um, didn't do uh, very well um, after being diagnosed with septoperitonitis. But the reason why this case is included is because it gets us thinking about if we see mineralized structures within the peritoneal cavity, then what do we need to think about and what should be on our differential list? And uh, yeah, we've, we've pretty much covered everything um, from uh, abscesses and gossip fibomas through to mummified kittens. Um, so yeah, nice job, guys. Um, does anybody have any other questions about case number four, our final case for the evening? No, everybody happy? So um, this is, I really like these radiographs. I think this this is quite unusual um, and uh, yeah, pretty, pretty spectacular. Okay, so before we wrap it up for the evening, do any of you guys have any questions at all about any of the cases that we've covered this evening? Okay, everybody happy? Well, I think you guys did an excellent job uh, of presenting um, these cases this evening, um, which brings me huge amounts of joy. So like I say, this is an interactive session and um, I really enjoy um, hearing your reports and your thoughts and feelings about these cases. So thank you very much to everybody for joining us and um, special thank you to all of those guys who participated. Um, so this uh, session uh, is being recorded and uh, it will appear on the LVS website. So if there's anything that you'd like to see again or hear again, uh, then uh, visit the website and it'll be available for you to review. Um, there's also a bunch of other stuff on the LVS website now. So if you click on the webinars tab, um, then uh, there's a few imaging webinars there uh, for you to have a look at if you're interested. And also there's recordings of the other uh, film reading sessions that we've done this year. So um, if you've missed a session and you'd like to go back and uh, review it, then it'll be available for you on the website. Um, so all that remains is for me to say thank you very much indeed for joining me. Um, I hope to see all you guys again next month um, for some more film reading. Um, stay safe and stay well. And uh, yeah, I hope we can meet up again same time next month. Thank you very much. <laughs>